what your country can do. Kennedy has been shot. Mark Wahlberg. And all men are created Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall. The transforming events of the 20th century touched every city and small town in America. Annual celebrations which children thrill to but can never fully understand mark for another generation the historical reminders. How the town survived the depression. How older people who walk among us unnoticed every day save democracy in the world. In every town, there are buildings which stand like silent witnesses to the enormous changes over these hundred years. A garage which started the century as a stable. When the Model T's became available, we could scratch together a hundred bucks and get a secondhand Model T. Schools, which today teach computer skills to every student, used to teach shop to the boys and typing to the girls. A school teacher said, just learn all you can about secretarial work. We can't expect women to get ahead in business. In some places, hometown coffee shops, for more than half the century, served whites only. People's attitudes had to be changed. And all it was was the color of your skin, for Christ's sakes. It was the color of your skin that, that, that made the difference. Memorials along American main streets commemorate those who died on the European battlefields of World War I. Such terrible scenes. You grew up very quickly in a, in a uh, surroundings like that. It was no longer freshman studies. It was uh, the real world. From almost every hometown train station, men left for World War II. When your husband becomes an officer, you're an officer's wife. And you do not show any emotions when they go overseas. You hold it back no matter what, no crying. And we did that. It was tough, but we did it. Korea and Vietnam veterans returned to towns which looked the same but they came back to a country which had changed. When I left, the only people that had long hair were uh, lived in San Francisco, you know, and uh, when I came home, my banker had long hair. When one New Jersey town held an old class reunion in 1997, you could see in the attendees the sweep of the entire century. There were those who remember when the electric light was new, and those who were born after man walked on the moon. Old and young, they had been together on a journey through the most common and yet mysterious of passageways. Time.
Unlike previous centuries where leadership was defined by royalty and other rulers, the 20th century more than any other was shaped by the will and actions of the common man. In the episodes of this series, we'll examine some of the defining events in each of 15 different periods. Our aim is to experience what it was like for the common man to be alive then. Politics and technology made this the killing century, but they also provided extended life and hope. In this first episode, we'll see that as the century began, there was no place on earth where hope flourished more than in the United States of America. In 1900, in the countries of Central and Southern Europe, tens of millions of people were trapped in miserable lives. They were starving and uh, things were real tough because when my father was a, a young boy of 12 or 13 years old, he was sent to a family in Cairo, Egypt, to become a vassal. And that's what they did with their sons. Peasants, they never got paid, they never made a living, they lived in, in huts. The Jewish people certainly were poverty stricken, they didn't have a darn thing. My people came from peasants. My grandparents on both sides of the family came from Sicily. Uh, my mother's side of the family came from a, a town called Chimina. In the small villages, what was there? Oppression and no food. One place held the promise of a better future. My mother and father, they heard about America from others, and they knew that America was heaven. It was worse than America, all problems would be solved. There would be food, there would be freedom, there would be no persecution. Freedom, freedom, an incredible word for those people. This country is in a state of unexampled prosperity. We are furnishing profitable employment to the millions of working men throughout the United States. By 1900, the United States leads in every major industrial product. I mean, we're producing more steel, we're producing more machine goods, textiles. The United States has one third of all the railroad trackage in the world. For the first time in human history, people can move over land swiftly, easily, reliably. The average American lived longer was better fed and better paid and had greater access to education than the average citizen anywhere else on earth. This is the great land of opportunity. No matter how low uh, you may be born, no matter how humble you may be, you can uh, rise to the top. The sky is the limit. On the eve of the new century, the sense of boundless possibilities also ignited an explosion of technological innovations that would have profound impact on 20th century life. Thomas Edison's electric light bulb and phonograph, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Tens of thousands of tinkerers across America were trying to invent the future. Among them were two bicycle mechanics in Dayton, Ohio. Orville and Wilbur, they as young boys were interested in flying. And they would sit on the porch and watch the birds. And the neighbors all around us say, I don't know what they think they're going to do, why they will never make an aeroplane. Mabel Greep and her sister Lorene live next door to the Wright brothers. Well, my father found out some way that they were going to try have a trial flight. So we got in the Surrey and we drove out to Huffman Prairie. I can hear Dad turn more than once and say, look, are you all paying attention to this? Now listen to me. You're gonna remember this till your last day. When that plane took off the ground, 
people were speechless. It was spectacular. It was unbelievable. One of the oldest dreams in human imagination had come true, sustained flight in a powered aeroplane. The United States was without in question the most inventive nation in the world in that period. It is comparable in its creativity to the Renaissance in Italy, for example, uh, to the period of Elizabeth in English history, the Shakespearean period. Americans have appreciated the new. They assumed that change was the natural course of history. And on America's roads, a European novelty was about to be reinvented. The first time we saw a car when I was a kid, well, that was for people out of this world. In 1900, there were only 8,000 cars and less than 10 miles of concrete road in the entire country. But the car was fast seducing Americans. The automobile gave people a sense of the control of their own destiny. That is, behind the wheel, out on the road, you decided where you were going, what you were doing, you had a machine at your control. But early cars were fantastically expensive. The Artsburger, made in Pittsburgh, and the Pierce Arrow were really toys for the rich people. Until one manufacturer in Detroit saw it differently. Henry Ford. He saw the automobile as a way to relieve one of the burden of working in nature by the sweat of one's brow. He was motivated by the desire to put the automobile into the hands of first farmers and then generally into the hands of ordinary people in the population. He wanted to produce many, many, many automobiles in a short, short time. Ford had this vision of smooth flow using an assembly line. These components were coming from up here. These components were on an endless lift. These components were coming on a belt. And they, everything is in motion. And I think the image of a number of streams flowing into a river captures the assembly line concept. Henry Ford's Model T was introduced in 1908 at the price of $825. I think it would have been considered un-American in his eyes to produce an automobile for rich people. That's what foreigners do. Americans generally were committed to the proposition that every man and every woman should enjoy material abundance. That was the American spirit. That's, that's America. It was the promise of material abundance and freedom which drew more than 13 million impoverished Europeans to America between 1900 and 1914. They came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, from Russia, and from Italy. It was the greatest free migration in all of human history. My mother's mother, Domenica, was afraid to travel on the boat. And the only way they got her on the boat was to, uh, her brother tricked her. He went on the boat with her and said he was going with her. And at the last minute, she, he tur she turned away and he left. My mother came by herself through Siberia. She got to the coast and got on a boat. They were just sitting on the deck. Hordes of people huddled over their possessions, which consisted of old pillows with feathers and the uh, few pieces of silverware tucked in there and stuff like that, the candlesticks, and sleeping on the deck with one another, next to one another to keep oneself warm. It took weeks and weeks and weeks. It took ages. When I crossed the ocean, I never saw such waves in my life. 
I never knew an ocean existed. Approaching the New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty was there, and it gave me a free feeling, a feeling of liberty, a feeling of a new nation, a feeling of a new hope for a beautiful life. There's something wonderful about being an immigrant. There's something so deliciously naive and happy about being an immigrant who has escaped from something. My father would say from time to time, no matter how bad things were, at least we're free. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it was said prosperity was measured by the thickness of the soot in the air. Oh man, whatever them furnaces let loose, the whole sky was <laughs> the whole sky was full of red dust. Full of red dust. If you had your wash out, you had your laundry out, it was too bad. You had to run outside and pull that laundry in because <laughs> it'd be covered in red dust. You would see them coal mines lit up from Greensburg all the way to Uniontown. It was wonderful to see it. Relentless production in Pittsburgh's steel mills, foundries, and coal mines attracted an enormous number of immigrants and poor whites and blacks from the rural South. It was their labor which fed the furnace of industrial America. You had to pick everything up. You had to move everything by hand. No lunch breaks of any kind. You worked and you had a sandwich in your hand. If you had to go to the restroom, boom, back right away. They timed you. Well, you get home at night, you couldn't lift your arms up. I remember this. Oh, I remember this distinctly. My, my father would come home and say to my mother, rub my arms a little bit because they were picking up. There was no, uh, <laughs> it was all mule work. I had two uncles that worked in the mill was dangerous. No safety precautions were in the mills. You could walk in the mill and see people with one arm, one leg. Uh, you had an accident in the mills almost every two days, but nobody did anything about it. There was no compensation for the injuries and death on the job, and it was almost impossible for workers in the early part of the century to organize. They try to start a union, and of course they had the coal and iron police, they were called in those days. And they would bust a lot of heads, and a lot of murders were committed, and a lot of, oh, a lot of things that uh, you daresn't say too much. If you worked in the mill, if your boss said something to you, that was it, that was the law. Industrial work involved six days a week, 12 to 16 hours a day. The daily wage, barely $2. Children, too, were made to work, two million of them across America, some as young as four. They did not complain as adults tended to do. Employers liked to think of them as happy elves. E.L. Doctorow wrote about child labor in his novel of life in the early century, Ragtime. They were more agile than adults, but they tended in the latter hours of the day to lose a degree of efficiency. In the canneries and mills, these were the hours they were most likely to lose their fingers or have their hands mangled or their legs crushed. In the mines, they worked as sorters of coal and sometimes were smothered in the coal chutes. As a child in the early part of the century, Pauline Newman worked 13-hour days in a New York garment sweatshop, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. We had a corner on the floor that resembled a kindergarten. You were not allowed to sing. We weren't allowed to talk to each other. The door was locked to keep us in. The locked doors would prove to be fatal. 
On March the 25th, 1911, fire broke out at the factory with an exit door locked on the ninth floor. Many workers jumped to their death. I was 11, and I remember all of a sudden, all of East New York went crazy because the kids were running around with the newspapers hollering extra that all these people had died in that fire. One hundred and forty six workers died. There were no sprinklers inside the factory then. There had never been a fire drill. The tragedy outraged a public that had become increasingly aware of both the underside of a prosperous nation and the need for reform. The great reform movement of this period is called progressivism. It's a belief in progress. It's a belief that we can make things better, that you can have a more just, more democratic society. At the vanguard of social reform in this particular period were progressive women concerned about their own inferior status. When, when I was a girl, a woman didn't have rights to custody of their children. They didn't have the right to own property. A woman teacher didn't have the right to marry. She didn't have a right to live alone. She had to, had to board with a family. And if she started dating, or she went out at night, she was fired. For progressives such as Francis Garrison Villard, suffrage, the vote for women, was the key to emancipation. Grandmother was a very strong, militant suffragette. As a boy, I was more inclined to, to laugh at them and dismiss them. I didn't see any reason why they should have a, a vote. I would say I believe that it's still a man's world and it would continue so for some time to come. Some suffragettes were mounting a violent campaign. In Britain, one of them was willing to die for the cause. In June of 1913, Emily Davison threw herself in front of the king's horse at the popular Epsom Derby. She died with the inscription, Votes for Women, sewn into her coat. That kind of sacrifice inspired American suffragettes to intensify their campaign. The right to vote would also prove elusive for America's nine million blacks. Black men could vote in theory, but in fact, most were barred by white intimidation, poll taxes, and literacy tests. 85% of black Americans lived in poverty in the Southern United States, segregated from whites by so-called Jim Crow laws, laws upheld by the Supreme Court that all but wiped out the freedom and equality once promised by emancipation. It is the complete denial of the American dream. They cannot go to the same schools with whites. They can't drink from the same drinking fountains. They cannot sit in the same part of a streetcar or in the same cars on a railroad. It's a horrible time. White politicians compete with each other in the South for being more, at least verbally, violent uh, toward, uh, toward African Americans and uh, in many cases are encouraging or at least abetting actual violence. They were lynching blacks for hardly a week that two or three blacks didn't get lynched. Or burned at the stake. I don't know whether you heard that or not. Do you ever hear of any black people being burned at the stake? Well, that's what happened. I would lived in those days. The most prominent black leader at the turn of the century, Booker T. Washington, accepted the notion of separateness. He asked blacks to better themselves through work and vocational training. From whites, he asked for help, not equality. Booker T. Washington was born a slave, called his autobiography, Up From Slavery. This is a man who has pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. And he takes the perspective that 
it would be foolish to challenge what's being done to them too soon and too openly. But there would be a challenge. In 1905, the black intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois urged a new struggle for full political and social equality. Entrenched resistance to such change would make civil rights, as Du Bois predicted, the major social issue in American life for the rest of the century. At the turn of the century, there were 76 million people in America. The majority of them lived on farms or in small towns, where they relied on gaslight and horsepower. Every morning, the milkman came, and the cream at the top would rise. And if you got there early, you could take a lick of the, of the cream before your mother found out what you were doing. It was the great period of the front porch. In the evenings after dinner, the family would uh, assemble on the front streets. Sometimes the neighbors would pass and we exchanged bows. We played games, I spy and run sheep run and lemonade, what was your trade? Tennis rackets were hefty and the racket faces elliptical. Women were stouter then. They visited the fleet carrying white parasols. Everyone wore white in summer. That was the style, that was the way people lived. But the rhythm of American life was quickening in the early years of the century as more and more people headed for the cities, for the bright lights and the myriad opportunities. I was four years old when I came to Chicago. It was uh, a real uh, magical thing to see the streetcars moving up and down and the street filled with people all the time and great activities going on. And I recall looking at it with wonder. The cities, New York City more than most, were centers for the latest engineering and technological marvels. The skyscraper is born in that time, completely new building form, a completely new idea that a city could grow up instead of out. It's an amazing sight to me. I saw the flat iron building. I saw the Woolworth Tau. It's a very stunning view, how a, a building can pierce the sky. And underground, there was a new way to travel. In New York City, the subway was inaugurated in 1904. One could ride the subway to the outskirts of the city, where the power of science and technology was harnessed for pursuit of a good time. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers went every day and night to Coney Island. When I came there, my brothers immediately treated me to a hot dog, Nathan's. I dug right into the water and tasted all over me the salt of the sea. I was baptized by nature. It was a kind of freedom that I never dreamt that I could have. That sense of freedom was also spread by the availability of ideas. In the early part of the century, some 9,000 public libraries in the country dispensed information freely and democratically. One man said to me, Alfred, do you know that there's a library on 42nd Street? I says, I do, but I was never there. He says, that's where you belong. You get all the literature in the world, and it doesn't cost you a dime. I read an immense number of books because I wanted to understand 
the American people's minds. I wanted to be completely American and forget all of my past. Immigrants themselves bringing new languages and customs were making the culture of the city just that much more diverse. The immigrant nourishment that this nation has always had, the incoming people, has been an extremely important part of our vitality, our ingenuity. It's like aerating the stream of life here. Early in this century, one in three residents of major American cities had been born somewhere else. New York had twice as many Irish as Dublin, and Chicago had more Poles than Warsaw. We had Polish people, we had Irish people, we had Jewish people, and we had Italian people. And they were all friendly, and we were all in the same boat. None of us had any money grandparents, the only place they can get rooms, literally, was on Elizabeth Street, which is where my mother was born. Uh, the apartment was two and a half rooms, three rooms, and maybe 14 people were living in it. And at night, it looked like, you know, a uh, hospital ward, I would think, with all these beds and all these people sleeping in these different beds. There were no bathrooms, they were toilets. They were in the hallway. But my mother and father, thought that this was wonderful because in the old country, the toilets were in the backyard. And the fact that in the kitchen, we had not only running water so that you didn't have to go to the well for water, but we had hot water. My mother, every week that she did the wash, she said, how wonderful, how wonderful we have hot water. Steadily rising income and declining work hours meant that for the first time, even working class people could go out in search of entertainment. Five cents bought a ticket to the newest entertainment phenomenon, moving pictures. We were so taken with the, the nickel shows. Two of us would uh, beg to be admitted by sitting on one seat. The earliest movies introduced simultaneously in France and the United States in the 1890s were simple tableau of anything that moved, either make-believe or what was called actuality. In 1903 came the first American film that actually told a story, The Great Train Robbery, a Western filmed in New Jersey. Its huge success made it clear that fiction was what the audience wanted most. There was comedies. And then there was The Pearls of Pauline, which was a serial that went on every Saturday afternoon. Every week she was in a, a situation. A lot of kids, it, it wasn't it wasn't a movie to them, it was actuality. Beginning in 1910, Americans were also seeing newsreels from around the world. It's coming as a great force for mass entertainment and for mass culture. There is this sense of possibility, the sense of openness, the sense of widening the horizons. What it does is it opens the world. In Havana Harbor on February the 15th, 1898, a mysterious explosion sank an American cruiser, the USS Maine. 266 officers and sailors were killed. Cuba was a Spanish colony 90 miles from Florida. Although there was no evidence of Spanish involvement, cries of revenge against Spain swept across America. But President William McKinley, who would lead America into the 20th century, was reluctant to go to war. President McKinley is a silver-tongued orator, very popular, sweet man, but a very indecisive man. They used to say that McKinley's mind is like an unmade bed. You have to make it up for him before he can use it. 
Much more eager for war and foreign adventure in general was McKinley's young assistant secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was a great believer in outdoorism, a great believer in activity. He was vigorous, you know. You could imagine him sort of taking cold showers all the time. And he carried all this in his character into his politics. He was a great believer in American power, in American imperialism, a great believer in war. War is one of the highest forms of human endeavor, he wrote. With Roosevelt and others lobbying intensely for it, Congress declared war on Spain in April of 1898. Roosevelt left his job in Washington to join the campaign in Cuba. Theodore Roosevelt organizes his old cowboy buddies from the West into the Rough Riders and goes to Brooks Brothers and gets a uniform made uh, and, and gets out a big saber and goes down there and storms San Juan Hill. It took the United States less than three months to defeat Spain in what one American official called a splendid little war. The spoils of war for the United States were the Spanish colonies of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. The United States was now an empire. At the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York in September 1901, President McKinley was killed by an assassin with no particular cause beyond his own dissatisfaction. Theodore Roosevelt, by then vice president, became America's leader. He's really the first president who sees the United States as a global power. America's century begins really with Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was an imperialist. He actually gloried in the term, and he wanted the United States to be a real empire exercising great power in the same ways that the great European empires did. Roosevelt's design included linking the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans by building a canal through the Isthmus of Panama in northern Colombia. Such a canal would greatly facilitate shipping and ensure America's strategic hold on the region. But when the Colombians refused to cooperate, Roosevelt encouraged the Panamanians to revolt against their Colombian rulers. Within a couple of days, we recognized the new independent Republic of Panama, and within uh, another few days, we had concluded a treaty with them. Roosevelt said, when other people dithered, and when other people uh, debated, I acted, you know, I took action. Construction of the era's engineering wonder began in 1904. Alfred Bingham visited the canal site as a child. I can remember riding along in this car on the bottom of the canal. A lot of big machinery and uh, a lot of uh, trains going up and down, taking the diggings out. And there were marvelous big structures that were the, to be the locks. The building of the canal itself was the greatest engineering feat that had ever been done up to that time. And, and it, it's, it's all of the great power and technology and energy of this age harnessed there. There's a wonderful photo of Theodore Roosevelt at, uh, at the controls of one of these gigantic steam shovels that they used to dig out the, the ditch. The Panama Canal is a wonderful expression, not only of him, but in many ways of America of that time. In mid-August of 1914, Americans celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal, a triumph of both technology and man's will over nature. An engineering feat as impressive as the pyramids the canal would also become the symbol of America's entrance into the international arena at a time when the world was becoming more dangerous. That same week, the great powers of Europe were headed for a violent encounter that none of them could even imagine, promoted by German ambition. 
Early in this century, Germany had emerged as the industrial power in Europe, rivaling Britain and already mightier than France, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia. But as Europe's youngest empire, Germany wielded little political Germany is really a great power and a leader of nations and wanted at least to be equal to others, not be considered less important than other powers like England. Under Kaiser Wilhelm, Germany was training the best land army in the world, five million men, and had begun building a powerful navy. To build that navy required nerve because it was a direct challenge to Britain. And that conflict between Britain and Germany is at the heart of international affairs before 1914. Britain responded by launching the most powerful warship on Earth, the Dreadnought. It was a revolution in naval warfare. It was an all big gun ship, big 12 inch guns. Also, the uh, dreadnoughts had the latest technological equipment on them, had electrical equipment, for example. Once the British had a dreadnought, the Germans had to have a dreadnought, etc., etc. The tensions fed by an arms race and rivalry among the major European powers finally came to a head in June of 1914, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in Sarajevo. There was no reason why the assassination of Franz Ferdinand would signal the collision of fundamental interests. It was a matter of choice, and that choice was made in Vienna and in Berlin to make it more than an assassination. In late July, with Germany's support, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia. And within days, all the great powers of Europe, bound by their various alliances, were at war with each other. I was at a camp, a boys' camp in New Hampshire in 1914, when the war was declared. And it was a shock to a very peaceful world. But nobody took it too seriously. The war was bad, of course, but it was also something that would be temporary and would not have a far-reaching effect. But this war would be more catastrophic than any which had gone before, one in which technology, the engine of progress, would be used in the slaughter of millions, a war that would sow greater hatred and result in far greater consequences than anyone could imagine in that summer of 1914. What was optimistically called the war to end all wars would draw America into an increasingly complex and dangerous world. That's on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us.